What's happening everybody? Dom here from Lens Pro to Go and Lens Rentals. Welcome back to the channel. So if you have been hawkishly following our content like I know you do, then you know that the last two videos were on this 28 millimeter and 40 millimeter Vazen 1.8X anamorphic prime in our F mount. So then it should be abundantly clear that in this week's video, I'm gonna be doing that same test and overview of this 65 millimeter T2 from this set, which also is my favorite lens of this set. It's just like the most anamorphic-y, just don't look it up, all right? And that is going to tie a nice little bow on this little mini series of lens review videos. So if you haven't seen them, go ahead and check them out. This week's video is, of course, going to be on this 65. So I'm going to start out by doing a physical overview of this lens, talk about its build and barrel design. Then we're going to jump into a more optical discussion of what's going on inside here. That's going to lead us to talk about coverage and check out some video tests. So without yammering on any further, let's chat about this 65 millimeter lens. And actually, before we start talking about this lens, like singly specifically, I do have a couple of notes about this whole set. So in last week's video on this 40 millimeter, I kind of made a comparison that like this 40 and 65 millimeters were like the older, like college age twin brothers to this smaller, slightly slower 28 millimeter that like just like got out of middle school. Point being is that there is a huge step in form factor and size going from this 28 to these 40 and 65 millimeters. So the 65 and 40 are pretty similar sizes, although the 65 is a little bit longer and it just gets that length from like that added flange distance right here. And also, I ranted a little bit about this in last week's video, so I'm gonna keep it pretty short, but I still don't understand why the design between these 40 and 65 millimeter lenses are so different. The Vazen logo is randomly like in bold and everything else is in the same colorway, but in a totally different font and like spacing. And this obviously has no effect on image or performance whatsoever, but it's just kind of annoying. It's like maybe something you would want if you spent like 10 plus thousand dollars on a three lens set. Anyways, let's talk about the stuff that matters, huh? The 65 millimeter is the longest in the set here at roughly seven and three eighths inches off the camera body, a little more obviously if you count the bayonet, giving it about a half inch on the 40 millimeter. And they do look very, very similar, but the 65's barrel is actually a bit smaller in width at pretty much both of the main like parts of this lens. So right at the widest part of the barrel, it's roughly four inches and in change, about 105 millimeters. But like the 40 millimeter, it also has this final lip down here right at the front, which drops down to the much more standard 95 millimeter front barrel diameter. So speaking of that too, I was actually tempted to say that the 65 millimeter wasn't going to have a threaded front filter option, but it actually does. I was gonna say that because the 40 millimeter doesn't, but this 65 does have a totally accessible 82 millimeter size filter thread, which granted, yes, is going to be a lot more uncommon, but that's an option. And again, I'm like, why, what's the difference between the 45 and the 60? Why couldn't that have it? The 65 is not the heaviest out of these three, however, it's 3.7 pounds. The 40 millimeter was closer to four, and yes, that is is still pretty hefty for a prime lens, but pretty standard for an almost 2X anamorphic lens that's this fast. Honestly, in the grand scheme of things, that might be on the lighter end. And as for the design of this lens, well, it's pretty clear to see that it very closely fits the form factor of the 40 millimeter, but not exactly. So these lenses would not be directly interchangeable on a rig with fizz motors set in position, for example. But that will not be the case switching between this 40 and 65 millimeter. So that's something to think about. Like the 40 millimeter, it similarly starts from this lens mount pretty straight with a little step up at the aperture ring, a little more space, and then this big drastic step up to the main part of the barrel where the focusing ring is. And this focusing ring also takes up a pretty solid percentage of the total area of this lens barrel, occupying all this space from the gear area to this whole area with the lens markings and stuff. And even under that area of the housing right here on the side, where behind this window it reveals more focus marks so people can see the 
focus distances from each side of the lens. And again, the barrel just continues really straight and flat for this whole part. And then right at the end, it steps down to achieve that 95 millimeter diameter for like a half inch or so. Also just taking a quick look down inside the lens barrel there, it's just straight glass. There's not that like square housing right up at the front, like on the 28 millimeter. It is actually there, but it's inset in the lens quite a bit. And just quickly looking back at the lens mount of this lens, I'm noticing that the rear element or exit pupil is the largest out of the set and housed in that black ring like all of them are too. And there is also a little crevice between that rear element group and the edges of the housing which can be sometimes concerning more just like practical clinical stuff here the focus ring takes a 300 degree turn along its entire focus range and also the iris ring throws about 90 degrees over its full range but who cares about all those superficialities let's talk about the stuff that really matters, the optics going on inside this 65 millimeter. We know that these are anamorphic prime lenses. More specifically, it's a 1.8X anamorphic stretch factor, which is the stretch factor that gives you the 2.39 by one widescreen format coming from a four by three sized sensor. And we are gonna talk about coverage and stuff like after we talk about the glass in this thing. These Vazen primes are front anamorphic lenses, meaning the those aspherical elements are up towards the entrance pupil of the lens rather than anywhere else in the lens. And this is considered to be a more friendly and cleaner design for anamorphic lenses. Also, while we were taking a look inside there, you probably noticed that a lot of the elements in these Vazen primes are pretty sufficiently coated with like a nice cyan royal blue color. And that is actually going to help give it that like quintessential blue anamorphic lens flare streak, which we will see in the video test soon. So just hold tight. But interestingly, I found out that Vazen also makes a version of each of these focal lengths with amber flares. So I'm gonna go ahead and assume that blue coating that's inside there on those amber lenses is gonna be more like burnt orange, sort of like goldish color that's going to give off that color flare, obviously. And I would love to do a comparison between those amber flare and these standard blue ones. Okay, the diaphragm of this lens, it's got 10 aperture blades that allow it to stop down to T16 and up to a wide open T2. Last note for optics here before we talk about coverage, which I actually also suppose has to do with optics but anyways close focus by my measurement I got 34 and three quarters inches off the front element so just shy of three feet off the lens which is pretty decent I'll take sub three feet now let's quickly talk about the coverage and the image circle from this 65 millimeter. If you remember the last two videos, the 28 millimeter, it very clearly vignetted even in circumstances that Vazen said it would not on their website. The 40 millimeter did a little bit better, but I still definitely got it to encounter some of those problems with the image circle too. So I'm really curious if I'm going to be able to get any vignetting to happen on this 65 because it gets to be a lot less problematic as you go up the focal lengths. And a lot of this can be verified by the 65 millimeters product page on Vazen's website. Though kind of confusing, unlike the product pages of the 40 and 28 millimeter, which had a lot of notes about where it does and does not vignette, there's absolutely no mention of anything to do with vignetting on the 65 millimeters page, even though this is going to be the least problematic focal length. So I kind of thought on their website they might have been boasting that, but maybe they just decided to exclude it because it's not really a problem. I don't know. So to start off here, I'm just pointed out a white wall wide open at T2 and focus to infinity, where if there is any vignetting, it's going to be the worst at infinity, which a little bit to my surprise, there isn't at all. And I'm in the four by three 1.8 X mode on the Komodo, which is the proper format. And even as I stop all the way down to T16, there is no visible vignetting whatsoever. But surely if I switch to that three by two mode, which gives significantly more visibility to the edges, then we'll start seeing some vignetting, right? Nope, 
Even here too, all the way to T22, there's absolutely no vignetting, even at infinity focus, which is great. You won't have to worry about this in absolutely any circumstance on this lens, just as I suspected where the angle of view of this 65 millimeter lens isn't really catching where that image circle falls off. So that's gonna lead us into our characteristic test. And actually given that vignetting test, I shot this in the technically incorrect 3 by 2 1.8 x mode on the red komodo which is going to show us the maximum amount of this lens's illumination although i will drop some four by three frame markers in there to help you remember where like the proper size of this is so here i have my awesome and stoic friend kyle here to sit in for me he's about five feet two inches from the sensor plane i have a film canister at the very edge of frame at the close focus distance of basically three feet i also have a felix p360 light at the backdrop up there creating a small but powerful source to give us a lens flare and also at the backdrop I have a set of blue string lights finally I also just like connected this long piece of shiny gold garland to that light in the background and that goes all the way to pretty much behind the lens so its whole focus range and then some. As I focus in and out here, I'm pretty impressed at its wide open sharpness. Even as we get to the close focus all the way at the edge of the frame, that film roll looked really sufficiently sharp, even in the corner there, which I love to see. And if you keep an eye on that film roll, you'll definitely notice a bit of lens breathing here as we rack towards the backdrop. I think it's pretty well maintained and I gather this is hard for anamorphic lenses to have no lens breathing whatsoever. And when we are focused back there, this reflection of the lens flare under the flare itself like almost starts to show up, but it definitely fades as we focus closer back to like four feet. And when I pan across here, notice where Kyle's face starts to distort and get warped in the frame. It's certainly happening, but it does not get too severe, even when he's all the way to the edge here. So that's pretty well maintained as well. And getting back to close focus now, I'll do the same pan here, but now it's good to focus on more of like the out of focus area and how the bokeh shift around and the lens flare. The bokeh stay pretty true to shape here, which is nice as well. So far, the 65 has done way better than the 40 and 28 millimeters in this characteristic test by far. I also love this lens flare. It's like the perfect ratio of intensity, but subtlety. And I feel like if I was out shooting, I could like control this and get it to to look how I wanted. And just like on the 40 millimeter, we get these three little blue and green reflection orbs. Pretty sure those are direct reflection of that Felix light. I find them pretty pleasing. All right, and interesting stuff happening at T5.6. So we are considerably sharper, of course, and have a much greater depth of field. So everything's just looking a lot more grounded. But of course here too, those bokehs are gonna get a lot smaller. The out of focus area gets a lot more tame and there's quite a bit less of a pop from the background. The film canister is tack sharp in this test here at close focus. And I have to mention a little out of place, but that lens flare gets a lot more intense at T5.6. Sometimes it literally creates like this rectangle of flares. And this comes from the main flare, the reflection of that main flare. Both of those have this like cross flare attached to them. And then you pretty much add all those together and they literally create like this lens flare rectangle. And as I pan around here, you can kind of see how that dies out at points, but also becomes stronger at points. And now that I'm at close focus and I panned around here, now you can really see the action on that lens flare. And also notice how the bokehs are much less likely to warp around and get weird here at T5.6 as well. And here I'm just gonna go through the whole aperture range at close focus so we can really see how it affects those bokehs. And on the right, I have a part of this image zoomed in at 300%. Thank you. 
And here, same thing now, I'm just toggling between wide open T2 and T2.8, where again, like the other two lenses, the real main difference that stands out to me between these two stops is just like that little rainbowy full spectrum like lens flare bloom and like extra little striations that come off that hard source when you're wide open on this lens. And finally here, I just killed some of the other lights and panned this Felix light around so we can really isolate that flare and see what it's doing to this image. All right, y'all, that is pretty much gonna do it on this video and this small series of videos covering these Vazen T2, this one's T2.2, 1.8X anamorphic primes in our F mount. If these videos got your imagination jogging a little bit, you're thinking about what you would shoot with this native anamorphic RF connection here on your camera. Is it the Komodo? Is it the C70? Let me know in the comment section below. We'll start a discussion about 1.8X anamorphic workflow. What else would you rather do on a Wednesday afternoon? If you happen to like this video, hit it with that thumbs up button down below to let me know you liked it. This is also gonna let YouTube know that you liked this video. It's gonna help bump it up in the old algorithm there, get other people watching it liking it, liking me. Also, if you're not already subscribed though, you're gonna wanna go ahead and click that subscribe button. Once you do, a little bell button is gonna pop up and if you hit that, then you're going to be in the loop for whenever we post new content. For those of you who have subscribed, you are awesome. Each and every single one of you is helping us get to that 100,000 subscriber milestone. So every single sub helps. Thank you very much and take care and we'll see you in the next one.